All right, we're here at the top of the hour. So we're gonna get started with today's webinar. Uh, I'm gonna go through our intro here and then we'll get right to it. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining the next installment of our cybersecurity awareness series. The purpose of this series is to break down some of the more basic cybersecurity principles and practices for local government staff and leaders in a way that is accessible, time conscious, and hopefully helps to build a strong culture of cybersecurity across your organizations. We've all been there. We have to watch that one hour long video and answer some questions about safe cyber practices. I'm not knocking those trainings, but cybersecurity requires a lot more than just a one and done training. We need to build a culture of learning around cybersecurity that helps us understand more regularly how what we, uh, what we do could be strengthening or weakening our organization's cyber defenses. Before we go into today's discussion on data backups, uh, I wanted to offer some quick background. Uh, my name is Jonah Wish and I'm a program coordinator at the National Cybersecurity Center. We're a nonprofit based here in Colorado with the focus of driving more cyber awareness and education. I help lead a program of the NCC called the Colorado Cyber Resource Center. The Colorado Cyber Resource Center is the joint product of local CISOs and IT professionals uh, working with the NCC to create a one-stop shop for local governments in Colorado for cyber resources and support. You can learn more at our website at colorado-crc.com. Uh, some quick housekeeping. We're recording this webinar uh, and it'll be shared on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, additionally, if you have questions during the discussion, please put those in the chat and we'll address them once Kelly has some time to get through his presentation here. Uh, so today, like I mentioned, we're excited to talk about data backups and storage, uh, which obviously is a, a very fundamental building block of cybersecurity. To walk us through this, we're grateful to have Kelly Sislow, a manager in Optiv's DGPP organization, data, data protection practice. His primary role is focused on leading data protection strategy efforts and overseeing the implementation of selected solutions. He has cybersecurity experience, including both on-prem and cloud architectures for both the public and private sectors. And in addition, he's a cybersecurity officer for the Colorado National Guard, specializing in defensive cyber operations for critical state infrastructure. Uh, and with that, Kelly, thank you again for being here and take it away. Perfect, thank you, John. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'd like to apologize in advance for the mustache. Uh, it is March, so it is mandated uh, for me at least. So with that being said, I will just go ahead and share my presentation. I I think you all can see it. Jonah, can you see the first slide? Yep, we can see it. Perfect, okay, so it should say security and you. Uh, okay, so I will breeze through this. I will try and keep it under like 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, as Jonah mentioned, this is some, you know, high level guidance in cybersecurity today. You know, what we face today, uh, what the variables are, what situations we find ourselves in, so on and so forth. Quick agenda, we just did the introduction, so I'll go back, I'll just skip that. We'll talk a little bit of background of where we are today, some quick stats, questions to ask yourself, what you can do, and then some potentially helpful resources. That's me, we just did that. So background. So we live today now where in a very non-traditional uh, cyber environment, whereas in something like 10 to 20 years ago, your technology stack transformation was very traditional. It was very homogenous. It was on-prem. Everything was done, uh, you know, within your own walls, within your own data centers, and everything was very close, closely tied together. And as the past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years has gone by, we've moved to become a very non-traditional and evolved multi-cloud, multifaceted, dispersed environment. With you know, in today's time, movement to the cloud is inevitable, right? All organizations to some capacity are moving to either SaaS, PaaS, um, IaaS, some of the more popular solutions being Amazon Web Services, Microsoft's Azure, and then uh, Google's GCP. 
But with that being said, if you're not using something infrastructure as uh, as a service, you know, you're most likely using some instance of Salesforce or Dropbox or ADP, which means the more sources that you use, right, the more services that are being used, the more locations data will be, which means there are more things to consider. There's more infrastructure to keep in mind, and there are more security considerations because as the architecture surface expands, so does the threat surface. So this is where we find ourselves today. We're looking at, we're trying to evolve the trusted enterprise perimeter or that perimeter uh, almost in an oxymoron kind of way is borderless. And again, widely distributed organizational assets and identities, it's all over the place. It's no longer right next to me. Uh, a lot of it, I don't even control. It's you know, given over to a third party. So this is where we find ourselves today, this kind of environment, a very heterogeneous multi-cloud, um, multi-system even environment. And no matter what you use, right? No matter if you are in the cloud, no matter if you are only on-prem, if you have a hybrid, uh, you know, hybrid environment, which includes some on-prem, some on cloud, the organization or you are always responsible for the data, no matter what. So even if there are, um, even in cloud environments, right? If there's a data leakage issue and it isn't solely your fault, that data, those consequences will still come back to you as the data owners. Data in general should be with the mindset that the data belongs to me. If I generate it, if I store it, if I keep it, if I process it, it is my responsibility. So this is just to show you that this is what's called the shared responsibility model. Um, that is, you know, generalized. Every CSP, every organization kind of has their own different ones. But in general, this is a pretty uh, accurate reflection. And as you see, data will always fall under the customer, the organization, what have you. So going forward, right, if architectures and environments are becoming drastically more complicated and we are still on the hook for data, you know, that opens up larger discussions, which is, you know, what we're here for today. On top of that, and I hate to talk about it, but, you know, the impacts of COVID-19 have been, have accelerated the absolute entropy of, you know, a decentralized environment or, you know, a a spread out environment. As COVID hit, people started not being in office. People uh, began to be very dispersed. A lot, not a lot of people know, but within the first six months of COVID, some there was actually one of the most increased amounts of uh, cyber activity for the reason that within the chaos of moving out of office and trying to figure out how to keep businesses together, uh, while not using offices and not using on-prem server software, whatever, people noticed, uh, malicious people noticed and kind of got after it basically uh, for lack of a better phrase. So COVID has essentially just accelerated uh, the pace to which people have spread out their architectures in their environments. It was happening, it, it was essentially happening anyways, but again, with COVID, it just, uh, it accelerated to a, a pretty a pretty big degree. Some quick stats. The reality today is data growth is insanely chaotic and it is uncontrolled. From a uh, you know consulting and cybersecurity experience, one of our clients, no matter where they are, whether it be finance, whether it be transportation, whether it be hardware manufacturing, one of the hardest things to do is know where your data is and keeping visibility on data, right? How can you protect something if you don't know where it is? And in a dispersed environment, in a multi-cloud, multifaceted environment, the reality today is that it is becoming extremely hard to uh, keep things under control. I think the last bullet probably does the best description is companies are challenged to get ahead of the cascading risk. And it really is cascading. This is, so these are stats from 2020 coming from Forrester, or sorry, uh, 2019, but excuse me, Gartner, 52% uh, of enterprises reported a breach in 2020, which is pretty insane. That means 
52%. That number is scary because that is 52% of the enterprises that reported it. That doesn't include any number of enterprises that either did not report for one reason or another, or didn't know there was something to report at all. So realistically, this 52% number is, is probably way higher. How much? One can only speculate, but it is a scary number nonetheless. The average data breach cost in 2020 for these breaches was $33.8 million. Which means if you're breached several times a year, you are paying that multiple value of $3.8 million. Uh, and most of this will come from so some sort of regulatory penalty or paying off ransomware. Essentially, this dollar amount includes any sort of uh, opportunity. So anything that's going to cost the organization money. So realistically, it, it's a big problem. And it is very, it's a very expensive problem as well. Next slide, you've got mail, right? 55% of companies in 2019 fell victim to at least one successful phishing attack. And 66% of all malware is installed via malicious email attachments. So you hear it time and time again, Don't, you know, check links, make sure they're not suspicious, do your diligence, so on and so forth. But it's, it's, you know, it's a real solid piece of advice, um, seeing how nearly three-fourths of all malware and all issues stem from some sort of phishing. And really, there's no reason to believe this will slow down. Email is going to continue to be one of the most attractive systems uh, attacked. And we see that a lot in our client-side engagements, where a lot of times when there are issues, it comes from either phishing or spear phishing campaigns. Uh, that were successful, that got out of hand, that causes big problems. And seeing how 250 billion emails are sent each day, it's really easy to become very complacent. I know for me, I get probably 85 to 100 emails per day. So knowing which ones are you know, valid and which ones need my attention, uh, it's, it's definitely a tricky task, but an important one nonetheless. So with everything, everything we've just seen, Right, we know that today's environment, today's cyber landscape is very dispersed. It's dispersed, it's complicated, it's daunting. So what are, what are kind of the big questions to ask yourself? What can you do within your own organization to make sure that you are practicing you know, what's called good cyber hygiene? So essentially, I broke it up into two things, questions to ask yourself and questions to ask management. Questions to ask yourself, do I understand my organization's data requirements? If I'm a data steward, do I know what that means for my roles and responsibilities? If I'm a data owner or a custodian, you know, what is my role and responsibility for data? And do I understand the whole comprehensive picture of that? And if the answer to that question is no, I would highly recommend doing some uh, uh, due diligence and due care to make sure that you know you are operating in the most safe capacity possible. That second bullet to ask yourself, am I complying with my organization's data requirements? That goes in with the first bullet, but am I complying? Am I doing things uh, as identified in whatever policy standards, processes, procedures that exist? Am I complying with my organization's data requirements? Hopefully, if you are not, there are some data governance um, controls in place that lets you know that you aren't. But again, this is just something to really mull over because if, again, if the answer to this question is no, you could be the reason for the next data breach within your organization. Then that third bullet, what is my compliance footprint? Similar to the second one, am I doing things correctly? Have I done my trainings, am I prepared for my own job? Is management giving me the thumbs up because I have, I'm doing my job exactly as stated or I am compliant. What about the compliance footprint of the people next to you, of the people you work with? Data is only as secure as the weakest link. And if an entire department, right? An entire department say consists of 10 people, arbitrary number, if nine people practice good cyber hygiene and have a good compliance footprint, but one person does not, 
the whole department is at risk. And then that fourth goal, how am I storing and processing data today with this very sporadic and decentralized uh, environment? Am I storing and processing data the correct way? Now, this question is going to be answered differently depending on where you are in your department. If you're in data analytics, for instance, you will have a lot more freedom and a lot more people less not willing to tell you what to do or how to do your job. But in some cases that we see, sometimes the ways of sharing data, right, within, say, again, the data analytics department is maybe not the most efficient way. So we, I mean, we have seen people pull down a frightening amount of data from, say, Tableau. And then instead of sharing it through the sanctioned means, they'll just attach it to an email and send it off or they'll upload it to their own Google Drive and then just give that person access because it just makes it easier. I don't think I need to go into why um, those, those, avenues, those particular avenues are uh, wrong, but just something to ask yourself, am I storing processing data today because you don't wanna be responsible for uh, what could ultimately happen? And am I using any shadow IT? Sometimes you don't even know you're using shadow IT and, and that's okay, the first step right, is uh, acceptance. <laughs> Accept that you have a shadow IT problem and then maybe you can move forward. I get it, the withdrawal, the, the draw to it is, is uh, can be very strong because again, it can be more efficient in terms, but it is a lot more dangerous. So those are just some quick questions to ask yourself. And the questions to ask management, what should you ask your boss? What, should, what do they owe you? Uh, because they should be guiding you. Right? They should be guiding the process because they are responsible as well. The whole, everyone shares responsibility here. Which regulatory frameworks is our organization abiding by? Do we use NIST? If we're using NIST, are we following, you know, can we accurately map what we do to the NIST framework? If not, why are we using NIST? Or if so, that's just more, you know, it's more comfort. Uh, what initiatives are in the pipeline to better safeguard the data that we handle? Most organizations, are fully aware and they fully understand that they have an issue or that they maybe aren't doing things to the letter. For that reason, it's also, it's very helpful to know and be informed of what is coming in the pipeline, right? So you can prepare for it. Not only prepare for it, uh, but also contribute if you can, right? If, if at all possible. The third one being how compliant are we as an organization? That is one of the first things that I ever want to know when I go to a client is I want to know what is our total compliance. Uh, just give me a, you know, a quick little view of how compliant are we as an organization for whatever framework we're abiding by, abiding by because that'll give you very, very solid insight as to what the problems are. And it'll give you an idea of, you know, what not to test, what not to try and make worse. So if say, for the compliance, there's a, there is a big shadow IT problem. If you're using shadow IT, it makes you more conscious of, okay, I'm contributing to the problem, but I know how to, you know, I know how to stop it. So that's, that's one of the, probably one of the most important things is how compliant are we as an organization? What can we expect essentially? And then what are the formal roles and responsibilities across our organization? Who is responsible? What are they responsible for? kind of thing. Uh, a very CISP way of putting this is, and for those who don't know, CISP is um, that big security certification that everyone likes to take. What are the formal roles, responsibilities across the organization? Who's the data owner? Who's the custodian? Who's the steward? Uh, who's the processor? So on and so forth. Because if these things cannot be answered, then management has a problem. And if management has a data problem, then that propagates. So again, security in data, data security at that is a shared responsible, right? shared responsibility. Going forward, what you can do, right here, here's what you can do personally besides ask yourselves questions. And again, this is gonna be kind of high level. This is something that we would probably show clients as well. Know your data, know the classification of the data you're working with. If I'm handling secret data or top secret data, Am I using it correctly? Be very conscious of the fact 
uh, of the classification of data that you're using because not all data is created equal and all demands different, all classifications demand different types of handling. Retention requirements, make sure that you are abiding by retention requirements. Remove or reduce data. If you don't need the data and the organization has cleared it and you're not violating a retention policy, get rid of it. Data remnants is a huge problem and it is everywhere. I cannot tell you how many times I've probably seen two, three, four, five-year-old PII that doesn't need to be there anymore, but just sits on workstations. And, and essentially, you know, reduce, only use the bare minimum amount of data you need. Um, if you're familiar with the data that you work with, um, also be familiar with the data that you don't need to work with. Data backups, best practices. So essentially, you know, backing up data, especially in the, in the ransomware era that we live in. I'm not gonna go too much into that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and the prevent unauthorized access, unintended exposure. Learn to recognize what bad looks like, right? Not only uh, what good is, but what bad is. Because then if everyone knows what bad is going to look like, it gives a more solid um, kind of reporting and feedback structure to management and will hopefully help prevent things before they happen. And then this next slide, this is, this is more of a, a quick reference guide. These are just, these are very, um, these are very general and basic uh, security, I would say security hints almost like if I was going to hand over 20 of my best security uh, recommendations to somebody. But again, this will be provided. I believe uh, Jonah said this will be provided at the end. So uh, feel free to look at these, but I'm not gonna go through every single one. But again, I think these are all uh, very helpful. And then to, to round it off with the resources, uh, we just included some, you know, some important links here, a link to your own policies and standards and procedures. But that, that's really all I'll say about that. Uh, that was, I kind of breezed through that, I, assuming there was going to be some questions, happy to answer anything. Uh, but for that, I think that's what I wanted to share. Thank you very much for uh, hanging with me there. Appreciate it. And then Jonah, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Uh, and uh, just so for everyone's reference, we are going to uh, share the slides as well, as, uh, as well as the recording of the presentation. Um, so Kelly, could you uh, pop out of the share screen mode here yes. the presenter view? Awesome, there we go. All right, so uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat there. Uh, we do have some questions um, that Kelly wanted to shoot your way. Um, so related to some of the things um, that you were talking about there. Um, one, I think just for the people on the call here, could you go into a, a description and some examples of shadow IT? Oh, okay. Question for me. Sure. Um, so shadow IT, I brought up the example of um, if you're going to share something, for instance, if you're going to share across teams and you have a SFTP, something like Kiteworks that is meant to do that, but I decide that's too much trouble and I don't really want to do that. What I'll probably do is again, not something I would do. I'm just saying this is an example of shadow IT. I would never do this. Uh, it would be uploading it to an unsanctioned SharePoint, maybe something like uh, Box or something like Google Drive and then just share permissions. It's really anything that's not sanctioned by the organization for use in a very specific use case, this use case being sharing data. Okay, perfect. And uh, Kelly, we've got a question from Nicole here. Uh, would you be okay with uh, sharing your email with the, the group that's on the webinar today? Sure. Okay, awesome. Um, just don't you, just don't try and fish me because <laughs> I'll catch it. There you go. There you go. Um, if you could put that in the chat here, I'm going to list off another question for you. Sure. Uh, so uh, you did a good job of going through some of your kind of client side engagements and experiences with um, with different uh, aspects of compliance. Um, wanted to just hear if you had any, any more, I don't know if war stories is the right word, but other examples of, of bad compliance, uh, that you could give as examples for everyone here. I, yeah, I've got some, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I can say. 
Uh, what I will say is in 2019, a certain financial industry who I was working for um, was not staying on top of compliance. And to be a little more specific about that, infrastructure compliance, right, at their perimeter, and then something very bad happened, um, which resulted in a lot of fines and a lot of people getting fired and a lot of time of me and my team being there. Um, in terms of maybe something a little more, a little more specific, I think one of the biggest ways people are out of compliance would be anything that has to do with logging and monitoring, right? Logging monitoring is a very complicated subject to touch and it is expensive. It's extremely expensive, but it's very necessary. Detective and preventative measures can't happen without some sort of logging mechanism. And a lot of people just think, oh, I'll just, I'll just use like a intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention system. Really what that means is they don't want to take the time to fully understand the issue. And if they did, they would know that mechanisms like these can oftentimes break downstream components uh, and are not at all efficient or sufficient by themselves. It's, it's all about layering, right? And it's everyone generates logs because they have to, that's policy, but no one does anything meaningful with their logs because again, it's tough and it's very expensive. So I would say compliance with logging monitoring is typically one of the worst areas, I would say. Okay, well, thank you for that, Kelly. Um, I've got two more questions here for you. And then I think we'll finish up here unless there's any other questions from the group. Um, so this one is more about, you know, an employee that's working remotely or working from home, which um, we do have uh, guests here, attendees here that are from different states. So some um, state employees or local government employees are still working from home. Um, what are some of the, the things I, sh I should be thinking about if I'm using my own devices uh, and, uh, Stay, trying to stay compliant with data retention or data backup uh, policies. So is this like a BYOD atmosphere? Yeah. So my suggestion to people who use BYOD, it's great. It's more flexible and it's in, in a lot of ways, it could be argued it's just a better, uh, it's a better system. But the organization itself has to be responsible for also monitoring. BYOD means just use the device that you feel comfortable with, not do whatever you want on your device. Um, so one of the big things, right, on that side where I just had a million bullet points, one thing I say is VPN, 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 because Wi-Fi is such a fickle thing and it is so incredibly easy to essentially hijack Wi-Fi. With VPNs, you're doing a little, you're doing a lot more. In fact, you're probably doing 98% of the work, 98, 99% of the work for protecting any sort of data in transit. In terms of data retention requirements and whatnot, at Optive, right, I have a laptop, which I'm talking to you from now, that has software on it where it allows Optive to maintain. So that means my antivirus software is updated at the intervals that they choose, right? My any patching happens through that. It's a, you know it's just kind of a central authority. BYOD is really good. There's still a lot of kinks to fix. I would highly recommend organizations uh, have control over those devices, though, because it is really tough to convince people. Because what are you going to reach out to people individually and be like, hey, did you did you back it up? Did you back up your data this week? Uh, it's just, it's not going to happen. It's, it's unreasonable to expect it. Um, so central control of uh, BYOD devices is something I would probably, you know, I'll, I'll probably die on that hill. <laughs> That's good to know. Uh, last question, and then we will, uh, we'll finish up here. Um, so let's say I'm on the other side of the equation and I'm a manager, um, not necessarily with any IT responsibilities, but I'm just the manager of a department where all of my staff and all my employees are using company um, devices. Uh, how would you, or how have you worked with clients in the past or people in the past in, in helping management uh, ensure or promote compliance with data backup or data retention or any data management strategies? Um, what are some things you would tell that side of the equation? 
So it, it's all about compliance reporting, right? Um, because again, it's really hard. As a manager, you are in charge of your team. That means you're in charge of their performance. You're in charge of their compliance. You're in charge of their health and well-being, which is I feel like an un, kind of like an unpopular thing for some reason today in, um, in America. But you are responsible for, uh, for your kids, right, for your team. And the best way to make sure that you hit the compliance angle of that is to have reliable compliance reporting. So for us, right, if I don't think I've ever had an engagement to where managers were specifically like they had that issue, but we had certainly had engagements where we try and tackle compliance. And if there's not good compliance reporting, um, then that's an issue, right? So the best way to do that is to have some reliable tool, some weekly check. Most organizations, right, every for their cloud environment, every week they'll sit down Friday before the weekend and they'll say, this is everything that happened in our environment today. This is the amount of fouls that happened. Here's the amount of vulnerabilities. Um, and then we think we can take care of these, this many things, so on and so forth. That really drives the compliance and health conversation um, is that just have good, accurate reporting. And if you don't, f- fix it ASAP, right? <laughs> I, would, I would highly recommend that. Because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and that's, that's, the scariest, that's the scariest scenario in cybersecurity is not knowing what you don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so looks like we don't have any more questions coming into the chat here. So we'll finish up. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining us here, uh, our monthly webinar uh, for cybersecurity awareness. Uh, Kelly, again, thank you for your time and joining us and providing your expertise. I will put this recording up on our YouTube page and you can check out more about the Colorado Cyber Resource Center at colorado-crc.com. Thank you, everybody, and, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you all. Appreciate you having me.